Welcome to the 2019 Constitution Day celebration for Stanford University. It's, uh, uh, my name is Michael McConnell. I'm professor of constitutional law here and director of the Constitutional Law Center. Uh, especially like to uh, welcome the, the many uh, familiar faces uh, I see in the audience here today, and perhaps, uh, uh, but even more, uh, the first year law students. Who are, can you raise your hands, those of you who are entering first year students? Special welcome to you. I don't know you yet, but I'll be getting to know you over the next several years, and it's great to see you here uh, uh, for this uh, uh, event. Uh, so Constitution Day is a, uh, an official holiday set up by Congress uh, for the purpose of reminding us of the importance of the Constitution. Well, I have a feeling that today we don't need to worry about that very much. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is, uh, <laughs> is doing that for us as the announcement. I assume most of you heard the announcement that there are going to be uh, impeachment proceedings. And if this is anything like uh, what it was uh, back in 1998 with uh, President Clinton's uh, impeachment proceedings, we are going to be hearing a lot about the Constitution. People who never heard of George Mason and James Madison and Edmund Randolph and so forth, they're going to be pouring over, we're going to be hearing their quotations, we're going to be uh, pouring over their words trying to uh, uh, make sense of this uh, uh, a document that has now uh, been uh, uh, governing our country for over 230 years. Um, so I say that this is our Constitution Day celebration, but many of you may be asking yourselves, well, uh, isn't this the wrong date? I mean, this is actually not September 17th. Uh, we usually, we try to hold this event as uh, uh, close to the actual Constitution Day, which is the uh, date on which the Constitutional uh, Convention delegates sign their names uh, to the document. As close to that as we possibly can, uh, but sometimes we have to deviate that uh, from that because of the convenience of the speaker or other things that are, uh, are going on. Uh, but it does give me the occasion to think a little bit and maybe talk a little bit about what was happening one week after the Const Constitutional Convention uh, ended because I think that's, uh, uh, that's kind of interesting. We don't talk about that very much. So on Sep September 17th, they signed the document. September 18th, they send it off to Congress in New York to be uh, uh, debated and then uh, disseminated to the states. Also on September 18th, the Constitution is published in six different newspapers in Philadelphia. Three days later, uh, it's published in New York uh, and in uh, Boston. Um, the uh, reactions to it uh, uh, were uh, remarkably different. Uh, one person happened to be the mayor of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, called it a miraculous document. Uh, some, another commentator said that it is a terrible monster with gaping mouth and terrible teeth. Uh, so, you know, somewhat different uh, 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 reactions. Um, the Pennsylvania legislature immediately uh, leaped into uh, the ratification process. Uh, and the first thing that they did was to order the printing of 3,000 copies of the Constitution, because this Constitution was intended to be read and understood by ordinary Americans. It is not in legalese. We can pick it up and, and, uh, uh, and understand it for ourselves uh, uh, today. It's not, a, uh, it's not an elite document. It was a document that is indeed of the people and for the people. But here's the detail I wanted to share with you, and really it's the whole point of this anecdote is that of the 3,000 copies of the Constitution uh, disseminated in Pennsylvania, a thousand of them were not in English. We often think that, to, you, know, you know, we're into bilingualism now, but uh, our, the Constitution was actually translated into German and published in German uh, almost as soon as it was published in uh, 
uh, in English. The Germans in Pennsylvania being the most, uh, the largest and most coherent uh, language minority uh, uh, at the time. So uh, some things uh, uh, never change. So here we are uh, commemorating Constitution Day a week later. Uh, already Pennsylvania was well into it. Uh, and so that's what we're commemorating today. But our custom here at Stanford is to invite a distinguished speaker uh, to talk on, a, on, an, on an issue of constitutional interest. Uh, and it is an especial a, a privilege and pleasure uh, to introduce this year's speaker. Special privilege because the Honorable Britt Grant was uh, I'd like to see the hands again. She was sitting where you were sitting, uh, what, less than 15 years ago. So she is an alumna of the uh, law school, graduated in, in 2007, uh, was in one of my classes. I think she's, so she's the first one of my students uh, to be on a, um, uh, on a United States Court of Appeals. Uh, after graduating from uh, law school here, uh, she went into government service. She served as Solicitor General of the state of Georgia. This is increasingly one of the most interesting jobs you can get in law as a young lawyer. That uh, Not all of the states uh, ha have Solicitor General positions, but many of them do. And it's an opportunity to actually be doing constitutional law at the highest level. Uh, uh, often Supreme Court cases, petitions, and, and so forth. Uh, I had the privilege uh, just a few weeks ago of, t of uh, talking to, giving a, 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 a several lectures to an assembly of state solicitors general, and my, are they an impressive bunch of people, and Britt was part of, the, of that. She then was named uh, by the governor to uh, the Supreme Court of Georgia, uh, where she served for several years and then was named to the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Um, and uh, I was very happy when she agreed to come back to the farm, back to home again, and share her thoughts with us about uh, the problems of, of precedent in constitutional law. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Britt Grant. Thank you, Michael, for the generous introduction. And I'll say it's a real treat to be back at law school today. That was a wonderful anecdote to learn, and it makes me wish that I could go take a few more classes um, just to keep learning. Um, it is my honor to be here as your speaker for Constitution Day at Stanford. I'm particularly excited that this gathering is sponsored by the Stanford Constitutional Law Center. I had the privilege of being one of the very first students to be involved in that center. Um, my group of classmates and I thought we were very clever when we created present at the founding t-shirts to commem commemorate our experience. Um, I was also present at the founding, I realized, of now Professor McConnell's career as a law professor here at Stanford, although we didn't know that at the time. I was in his very first creation of the Constitution class while he was still a judge. Um, uh, that class provided an extraordinary intellectual, philosophical, and historical grounding for the study and interpretation of the Constitution. We were also, as a sidebar, thrilled to have a descendant of what who we all agreed was a largely underrated founding father, Governor Morris. Um, Governor Morris, not Governor, Governor, um, was one of the few delegates who spoke passionately against slavery and he's also widely credited with authoring the preamble to the Constitution. Um, enough about our friend Governor. I'm sure I will say something incorrect if I keep going, and I'm pretty certain that Michael will not hesitate to correct me. Um, all that to say, I was thrilled to have the opportunity to learn from Professor McConnell um, back when he was Judge McConnell, and happier still for Stanford when he hung up his robes to turn back to teaching. Um, the judiciary's loss has been Stanford's clear gain. Um, thank you for the invitation this year. I was also lucky enough to be a student of now Dean Martinez. Um, she was one of my first law professors, and she was a great example to so many of us as a smart, 
thoughtful, accomplished woman, you'd also be very surprised, uh, given that she had just argued an important case before the United States Supreme Court, to know how much you could learn about CivPro from a case about enemy combatants. So that was one of my chief memories of a great class with now Dean Martinez. Um, as I said, I love being a student at Stanford Law School. I'm proud to be an alumna. Um, and one thing I want to emphasize before I get to my remarks on precedent is what a wonderful environment this was for debate, for learning. Um, I recall many heated and passionate conversations about war and peace, um, about policy and practice, about the rule of law. And I also recall going to lunch at Tresser afterwards or having a beer afterwards. Um, no place is perfect, but the ability of Stanford Law students to talk and reason with one another and on topics that fundamentally divided us while still having confidence in one another's good faith was extraordinary. And I hope that that spirit continues now. I know it does for me. When I was nominated to the 11th Circuit, I was so honored to see that a group of fellow Stanford alums had shared with the Senate a letter recommending my confirmation. Um, many of these students were ones with whom I'd had some of those great, vigorous, good faith debates Students who I know we disagreed on political matters. I know we disagreed on matters of judicial approach and philosophy, but those differences were not what this bipartisan letter focused on. What the letter focused on was what we had in common in terms of our respect for the rule of law. And I work every day to live up to the, um, the trust that my classmates put in me to have respect for the rule of law and not for the outcomes that I would seek if I were sitting in Congress or somewhere else. Um, I encourage all of you here, both students and members of the community, to do what you can to keep that kind of atmosphere um, available and a place where we can all learn and grow. To that end, I'm gonna do what I can to facilitate a vigorous discussion about one of the most hot topics right now, I think, in constitutional law, which is precedent, and along with precedent, stare decisis. As one commentator put it, the number of recent decisions by the Supreme Court of the United States overruling earlier decisions of that court has profoundly disturbed a large section of the bar of the United States and a considerable number of its thoughtful citizens. Although it has rendered lip service to the doctrine of stare decisis, its opinions have given the impression to many that it takes rather positive delight in overthrowing principles long established and by many well cherished. Quite naturally then, the question has arisen, what has happened or is happening to the doctrine of stare decisis? I trust that this commentary will not surprise you whether you agree with it or not. But what may surprise you is that it's pulled from a 1946 Law Review article. Um, the point is that precedent and stare decisis have always been challenging questions. One commentator said, the list of opinions destroyed by the Warren Court reads like a table of contents from an old constitutional law casebook. And I have it on very good authority that when Chief Justice Berger was asked how much deference he planned to give the doctrine of stare decisis, he responded that he planned to give the doctrine of stare decisis all of the deference that the Warren Court gave to it. That declaration is consistent with what many observed as reality, um, with one commentator noting, as with the Warren Court critics, many of the Burger Court critics are claiming that the court has discarded precedent and tradition. Nor did the Rehnquist Court escape the charge that it had abandoned stare decisis. In his last opinion before retiring, Justice Marshall argued that power, not reasoning, is the new currency of the court's decision making. And Linda Greenhouse of the New York Times remarked that some precedents were overruled, others sharply limited, and a gaudy show of zero-based jurisprudence. And of course, the Roberts Court has received the same pushback, both internally and externally. I'll get to some of the internal later, um, but for now, by way of example, Professor Tribe has said that the Roberts Court has increasingly tended to, to treat long-established precedent as entitled to no respect. To take such a dismissive stance toward precedent is to empty it of all significance treating every issue confronting the court as though it were a matter of first impression. Interestingly, Professor Jonathan Adler has a statistical counterpoint that has been echoed by empirical SCOTUS, which is that the Roberts Court 
has actually overturned precedents at a lower rate than its predecessors. By his calculations, the Warren Court overruled an average of 4.27 cases per term, the Berger Court 4.12, the Rehnquist Court 2.63, and the Roberts Court 1.38. Those figures do not include the October 2018 term, although I was hoping to receive an update um, before this particular talk, nor can they predict what the future holds. But I do appreciate the opportunity to insert some data into what is often a theoretical discussion. Um, another insight from Professor Adler is that during the early part of the Roberts Court, when precedent was overturned, it was almost always because Justice Kennedy had concluded that the earlier precedent was incorrect. For obvious reasons, that is a pattern that will no longer continue, but it's one that bears a lot of interest in looking to see how the court's jurisprudence develops in the future. So all that to say, the current debates about stare decisis are not new. You may have seen that the title of my speech is The Paradox of Precedent. Besides the fact that a little alliteration is always nice in a speech title, paradox really does get at the American approach to precedent. As a textualist, one of the first places I'll go to explain my thinking is a dictionary. Um, some of the relevant definitions of the term paradox um, are instructive here. First, I do not mean contradiction, incongruity, anomaly, or conflict all of which are listed as synonyms. What I do mean is this, a seemingly self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true, as well as this, a situation, a person, or thing that combines contradictory features or qualities. Now, there's nothing contradictory about precedent, but there is some tension inherent in how legal thinkers approach it. On the one hand, of course, we follow and respect precedent. That's an unshakable foundation of our legal tradition. But on the other, we also need to get it right. The Constitution and the text of statutes have meaning, and it's important for judges to offer that meaning correctly in our decisions. Um, an incorrect legal interpretation is just as incorrect if someone else came up with it as it is if I came up with it. And so these competing goals of constitutional and statutory meaning on the one hand and stability on the other can be really difficult imperatives to square. As Chief Justice Roberts has put it, when considering whether to re-examine a prior erroneous holding, we must balance the importance of having a constitutional question decided against the importance of having it decided right. So what I want to do today is spend some time talking about precedent. And of course, the most important doctrine related to precedent, which is stare decisis, which means stand by the thing decided and do not disturb the calm. I will count a little bit about that doctrine's origins and then share a few perspectives that Supreme Court justices on the current court have used so that you can consider those as you unpack your own approach to this important question. However, let me state this clearly. As a circuit court judge, it is my job to follow precedent, period. If the Supreme Court has made a particular holding about the Constitution or a statute or anything else, it's my job to apply that holding in the cases that come before me. And if an earlier panel in my own court has made a particular holding, I apply that as well, unless, of course, the court grants en banc review and overturns our own precedent, which happens very rarely. So the job of a circuit judge really is to figure out what the precedents are and how they apply to current cases. Sometimes that's simple, and other times it's not, but that is the job. The job of the federal Supreme Court and state Supreme Courts um, sometimes does involve reconsidering precedents. But how do we get there? The traditional Anglo-American approach, one that's not universally shared, is that judicial interpretation acquires the power of law. We often take this for granted within our system, but it's not at all obvious that applying binding force to the holding in one case to the different facts of another case is the only way to do it. It is, however, the way that we do it. The beginnings of this rule emerged early in the Anglo world. Our old friend from the 18th century, William Blackstone, explained in his commentaries, of the, of the law, commentaries on the laws of England that in the profound ignorance of letters, which formerly overspread the whole Western world, all laws were entirely traditional for this plain reason, that the nations among which they prevailed had but little idea of writing. In other words, no one could read. 
So the only way to have a rule of law was for, um, for those enforcing it to memorize it. Um, Blackstone went on, thus the British as well as the Gallic Druids committed all their laws as well as learning to memory. Roman law, in contrast, was often, had often been written and included common law elements when the written law was insufficient rather than the primary source of law. Blackstone explains that even as written law developed within the Anglosphere, some unwritten common law remained. And some of these principles will sound quite familiar. The king can do no wrong sounds pretty broad to our modern ears, but of course, that's the, the foundation of sovereign immunity that we have still today in this country. Um, and of course, no man shall be bound to accuse himself is reflected in the Fifth Amendment's privilege against self-incrimination. Blackstone also says that judicial decisions are the best and most authoritative evidence that a custom exists as part of the common law. According to him, judges are the depository of the laws, the living oracles who must decide in all cases of doubt and who are bound by an oath to decide according to the law of the land. I will say I take a much more narrow approach than Blackstone about the, the nature of a judge as an oracle, but his, um, his point is well taken that, especially at that time, judges had a heavy burden to learn and understand the precedents that existed. Here we get to the main point on precedent and stare decisis. For it is an established rule to abide by former precedents where the same points come again in litigation, as well as to keep the scale of justice even and steady and not liable to waver with every new judge's opinion. This description from Blackstone of the duties of a judge encompasses the role of precedent, and it's also an early glimpse into the separation of powers concepts that are at the foundation of our constitutional government today. It is up to judges to make the laws we see best. And it is not up to judges to make the laws we see best, but to interpret and apply it. The Founding Fathers, of course, echoed these same points. In Federal 78, for example, Alexander Hamilton writes, to avoid an arbitrary discretion in the courts, it is indispensable that they should be bound down by strict rules and precedents, which serve to define and point out their duty in every particular case that comes before them. Later authorities also extol the virtues of precedent and stare decisis and add some practical considerations to the mix. Benjamin Cardozo said in 1921, I think adherence to precedent should be the rule and not the exception. I've already had occasion to dwell upon some of the considerations that sustain it. To these, I may add that the labor of judges would be increased almost to the breaking point if every past decision could be reopened in every case, and one could not lay one's own course of bricks upon the secure foundation of the courses laid by others who had gone before him. As an appellate judge in a court that sits in panels, I can tell you that these practical factors make an extraordinary difference in both the efficiency and the consistency of the law. So justice after justice has extolled the benefits of continuity, of certainty, and of predictability. Um, justice Frankfurt, Frankfurter says, stare decisis embodies an important social policy. It represents an element of continuity in law and is rooted in the psychologic need to satisfy reasonable expectations. Justice Harlan said for a unanimous court, very weighty considerations underlie the principle that courts should not lightly overrule past decisions. Among these are the desirability that the law furnish a clear guide for the conduct of individuals to enable them to plan their affairs with assurance against untoward surprise, the importance of furthering fair and expeditious adjudication by eliminating the need to relitigate every relevant proposition in every case, and the necessity of maintaining public faith in the judiciary as a source of impersonal and reasoned judgments. Precedent is king and stare decisis is, is essential. So there's no disagreement in our legal tradition, right? <laughs> Not quite. Um, even from the start, Blackstone um, offers an important caveat, which is this rule admits of exception when the former determination is most evidently contrary to reason much more so if it be contrary to the divine law. But even in such cases, the subsequent judges do not pretend to make a new law, but to vindicate the old one for misrepresentation. For if it be found that the former decision is manifestly absurd or unjust, it is declared not that such a sentence was a bad law, but that it was not law. That is, that it was not the established custom of the realm as had been erroneously determined. 
Blackstone goes on to say, the doctrine of the law then is this, that precedents and rules must be followed unless flatly absurd or unjust. For though their reasons be not obvious at first view, yet we owe such a deference to former times as not to suppose that they acted wholly without consideration. So Blackstone, who's credited by most observers with being the actual earliest to suggest a firm rule of stare decisis, um, is inserting an important caveat that if a decision is manifestly incorrect, contrary to reason or to the divine law, then it was not really the law. Um, of course, Blackstone also cautions, as you heard, that judges should not jump quickly to this conclusion. Um, deference should be offered to earlier understandings developed in former times. But the question is this, how do you draw a principled line between the necessity of <clears throat> following precedents and the much rarer instances where precedent should be disregarded because it's incorrect? As one commentator put it, the countervailing interest in accurate legal judgments must be weighed against the policies of stability and legitimacy. And really, how could we say in the face of cases like Plessy v. Ferguson that was corrected in Brown versus Board that precedent should never and can never be overruled? It would be antithetical to our conception of the Supreme Court's responsibility to correctly interpret the Constitution. And the Court's recent treatment of the Korematsu case, which had approved of the internment of Japanese during World War II, is another expression of the court's compulsion to overturn precedents that have been revealed to have no basis in the Constitution. Unsurprisingly, justices have raised, raised a range of objections to the idea that precedent must always be followed. The other ever pithy Justice Scalia, of course, has much to say, including that treating precedent as infallible would mean that, quote, the governing principle of this court is the notion that an important constitutional decision with plainly inadequate rational support must be left in place for the sole reason that it once attracted five votes. Justice Stevens, on the other hand, quoted Justice Cardozo, but didn't we already hear from him in favor of stare decisis? In support of a standard that would enable the court to overrule prior decisions on the basis of their inconsistency with the Supreme Court's sense of justice, with the social welfare, or with the mores of their day. At other times, Justice Stevens argued that precedents should only be set aside if they're egregiously incorrect. So we can see the justices wrestling with this tension from case to case. And going back in time somewhat, the liberal lion, Justice William Douglas, an opinion later cited by Justice Scalia, said, a judge looking at, constitu at a constitutional decision may have compulsions to revere past history and accept what was written. But he remembers above all else that it is the Constitution which he swore to support and defend and not the gloss which his predecessors have put on it. Justice Douglas, in fact, went so far as to characterize the, ro the role of stare decisis in constitutional law as tenuous. Justice Brandeis offered a similar approach and said, the court bows to the lessons of experience and the force of better reasoning, recognizing that the process of trial and error so fruitful in the physical sciences is appropriate also in the judicial function. Finally, as Justice Frankfurter put it, wisdom too often never comes, and so we ought not to reject it merely because it comes late. You'll recall again that we heard from Justice Frankfurter on the other side of stare decisis, advocating um, maintaining a precedent. The fact that so many justices have stirring words on both side of the, sides of this equation is evidence of the incredible tension inherent in how the Supreme Court deals with precedent. Now, all this background will give us a more layered perspective on the current court and some of the approaches to stare decisis. I'll close today by highlighting the approaches of three current Supreme Court justices, Justice Clarence Thomas, Justice Elena Kagan, and Justice Samuel Alito. I'm including Justice Thomas and Justice Kagan as examples because many observers would cite them as the two current poles of the court. Um, I include Justice Alito because he's a great example of the workability prong and also just a really fun and funny writer. Um, as in all of my remarks today, these examples are descriptive rather than normative and introductory rather than expository. First, Justice Thomas. I've spent some time discussing the push-pull that's the heart of the debate over when and how to apply past precedents, the competing goals of correctness versus stability, 
Um, but Justice Thomas has a pretty straightforward answer to that question, and that is we choose correctness, period. Justice Thomas described his rule. When faced with a demonstrably erroneous precedent, my rule is simple. We should not follow it. That comes from a fascinating concurrence that he wrote just this past term in Gamble versus United States. That case, you may recall, is one in which Gamble challenged the dual sovereign doctrine, which is the longstanding rule that the double jeopardy clause does not bar prosecutions for the same conduct by the state and the federal government um, if one comes before the other. In other words, if someone is tried and acquitted of conduct in a state trial, double jeopardy does not bar a subsequent federal trial and vice versa. Um, the Supreme Court upheld its past precedent that the double jeopardy clause does not apply in that context by a seven to two vote with Justices Gorsuch and Ginsburg each writing a separate dissent. Justice Thomas wrote a concurring opinion, but that opinion contained very little about the double jeopardy clause. In fact, it was one paragraph in a 17 page opinion. The rest of the opinion addresses the proper role of stare decisis in Justice Thomas's view. Justice Thomas says that in his view, quote, the court's typical formulation of the stare decisis standard does not comport with our judicial duty under Article III because it elevates demonstrably erroneous decisions, meaning decisions outside the realm of permissible interpretation over the text of the Constitution and other duly enacted federal law. Thomas goes on to say that by applying demonstrably erroneous precedent instead of the relevant law's text, as the court is particularly prone to do when expanding federal power or crafting new individual rights, the court exercises force and will, two attributes that the Constitution, that the people did not give it. There, of course, he's referencing again Federal 78, which says the judiciary has neither force nor will, but only judgment. Justice Thomas goes on to explain that the four factors ordinarily considered when evaluating the staying power of precedent, the workability of the standard, the antiquity of the precedent, the reliance interests at stake, and of course, the correctness of the original decision. Um, the influence of this last factor, he says, tends to ebb and flow with the court's desire to achieve a particular end, and the court may cite additional ad hoc factors to support the result it chooses. He explains that this approach may have made sense in a common law system in which courts developed law through judicial decisions rather than the current system of largely written law, textual law. Um, and he knows that the Constitution does not mandate that judicial officers swear an oath to uphold judicial precedents. He argues instead that judicial power must be understood in light of the Constitution's status as the supreme legal document meaning that the power of the court to give legal effect to prior judicial decisions that incorrectly interpret the Constitution cannot take precedence over the Constitution itself. The primary objection to this sort of approach has always been the stability of the law. Justice Thomas responds that the court would eliminate a significant amount of uncertainty and provide the very stability we sought if we replaced our malleable balancing test with a clear principled rule grounded in the meaning of the text. It's an interesting conception. He does, I should add, leave room to maintain precedents that seem incorrect, but that still remain within the realm of the permissible. I encourage everyone to read the full dissent, which considers Blackstone and other authorities that we've discussed today. Whether you agree with it or not, and it was a solo concurrence, um, Justice Thomas's approach offers the most straightforward way of dealing with the stability and correctness conundrum that has faced the court for so many years. Um, on the other side of this balance is Justice Elena Kagan, who has thoroughly embraced the goal of stability through precedent and the four-factor balancing test that I just outlined. Others have two, including, of course, Justice Breyer, um, but Justice Kagan's writing is particularly vivid, so that's who I'll share with you today. One of her most interesting writings in this topic comes in the Janus case, in which a majority of the court overruled Abood v. Detroit Board of Education and held that mandatory public sector union fees were unconstitutional coerced speech. Justice Kagan disagreed with the majority's conclusion that Abood was incorrectly decided, but her strongest language was reserved for another aspect of the decision. The worst part of today's opinion is where the majority subverts all known principles of stare decisis, 
The majority makes plain in the first 33 pages of its decision that it believes Abood was wrong. But that is not enough. Respecting stare decisis means sticking to some wrong decisions. She goes on to say, there is no sugarcoating today's opinion. The majority overthrows a decision entrenched in the nation's law and in its economic life for over 40 years. And it does so by weaponizing the First Amendment in a way that unleashes judges now and in the future to intervene in economic and regulatory policy. Justice Kagan discusses the fact that overturning precedent should involve one or more plus factors beyond whether or not the precedent is correctly decided. That, of course, is the heart of the disagreement between Justice Kagan and Justice Thomas. She closes with this. So the majority's road runs long, and at every stop are black-robed rulers overriding citizens' choices. The First Amendment was, met, was meant for better things. It was meant not to undermine, but to protect democratic governance, including over the role of public sector unions. I will add that Justice Kagan herself has not yet authored an opinion that directly overrules a Supreme Court precedent. She's joined as many as three, depending on how one evaluates it, and has also indicated that she will never accept the result in the recent partisan gerrymandering, gerrymandering case, Rucho v. Common Cause. So there's reason to think that she would overrule that case if given the opportunity to do so. Still, and in spite of complaints from fellow justices that her decision upholding our resulted in a zombified version of that doctrine, Justice Kagan appears much more inclined to uphold precedent as a general matter than does Justice Thomas. Comparing the Thomas and Kagan writings and setting aside whatever policy or outcome-based agreements or disagreements you may see yourself having with either justice provides a fascinating window into the relative ways that judges and justices choose to value and weigh the correctness of a legal interpretation versus the stability of the law. And as promised, I also want to tell you a little bit about the approach of Justice Alito. Justice Alito is said to have a robust role for both precedent and pragmatism in his overall jurisprudence. There's certainly a ring, a pragmatic ring, to the following passage, which opens his dissent in Mathis v. United States. In Mathis, the Supreme Court declined to find an exception for statutes that list multiple alternative means of satisfying one or more of a crime's elements to the rule that a prior qu crime qualifies as an Armed Career Criminal Act predicate if, but only if, its elements are not the same as or narrower than those of the generic offense. Got that? <laughs> Justice Kagan, I will note, wrote the majority opinion. And Justice Thomas interestingly concurred concluding that the majority's opinion faithfully applies our precedents. Now, the fact that even many, or maybe all, of the highly educated, intelligent people in this room did not fully understand what I described as Mathis's holding is a good indicator that this case is one in a line of increasingly complicated and technical precedents relating to the Armed Career Criminal Act. I think you'll find it fair to consider Justice Alito's primary concern to be the workability of past precedents when you hear his opening paragraph. Sabine Moreau lives in Salra sur Sambre, a town in Belgium located 38 miles south of Brussels. One day, she set out in her car to pick up a friend at the Brussels train station, a trip that should have taken under an hour. She programmed her GPS and headed off. Although the GPS sent her south, not north, she apparently thought nothing of it. She dutifully stayed on the prescribed course. Nor was she deterred when she saw, ro saw road signs in German for Cologne, Aachen, and Frankfurt. I asked myself no questions, she later recounted. I kept my foot down. <laughs> Hours passed. After crossing through Germany, she entered Austria. Twice, she stopped to refuel her car. She was involved in a minor traffic accident. When tired, she pulled over and slept in her car. She crossed the Alps, drove through Slovenia, entered Croatia, and finally arrived in Zagreb, two days and 900 miles after leaving her home. Either she had not properly set her GPS or it had malfunctioned. But Ms. Moreau apparently refused to entertain that thought until she arrived in the Croatian capital. Only then, she told reporters, did she realize she had gone off course. And she called home where the police were investigating her disappearance. 26 years ago, Justice Alito says, in Taylor versus United States, this court set out on a journey like Ms. Moreau's. 
Our task in Taylor, like Ms. Moreau's short trip to the train station, might not seem very difficult. Determining when a conviction for burglary counts as a prior conviction for burglary under the Armed Career Criminal Act. But things have not worked out that way. Justice, Justice Alito's dissent closes with these words. Who knows when, if ever, the court will call home. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this ride through precedent and stare decisis. The questions about how Supreme Court justices should re respect precedent and apply stare decisis dates back to Blackstone and continues to this day, continue to this day. I've only been able to scratch the surface of their development, and I encourage all of you to read about and consider them more deeply, and to consider overall approaches rather than how these approaches may pan out in particular cases. Thank you. Uh, so we have about 20 minutes for questions, and there's a mic on this side, and there's a mic on that side. So if you just want to raise your hand if you have a question, I can come bring the mic to you. I'm interested in the idea of a super majority. It sounds to me the Supreme Court and a lot of courts are in a situation where five to four makes a decision which is overwhelming. I'm wondering if it's legal for them to say a five to four decision is only for one case, but it requires a six to three or something to overturn stare decisis or to make a constitutional evaluation that will stick. You know, there's been a lot of interesting debate about those questions recently, as we talked about, um, the court is getting a lot of a lot of feedback on its approach to stare decisis. I will say for me as a circuit judge, whatever the Supreme Court decides is legal is legal. Um, that will be the answer for me. It's, a, it's an interesting debate. I think it's unlikely, personally, that they would ever come to such a decision, but it is interesting, an interesting thing to think through. Thanks for being here, Judge Grant. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the relationship between the Supreme Court's concern for its institutional legitimacy and that, uh, how that might um, relate with the notion of upholding stare decisis or overturning past cases. So I won't, I won't speak for the United States Supreme Court, um, but what I can say is from my own experience as a member of a state court of last resort, um, we, or I, took precedent very seriously, but also sometimes was in a position where for a variety of reasons it was clear that that precedent needed to be um, overturned or clarified. And in that situation, I think that the, my approach on the very, best, the very best thing that could be done for the court's institutional reputation was to explain as thoroughly as I could why that particular precedent in the first place was erroneous, and in the second place um, that there were other reasons that it was important for that particular precedent to be changed at that point. So for me, on a, speaking for myself, it was important to provide a clear explanation. Um, and that was an approach I took in all my cases and still do, that I, I think it's my duty as a judge to make everything as understandable as possible to the litigants and to future courts who will, who will read that decision. Thank you, Judge. And it's the 1L crew over here. Good there's job, some guys. other 1Ls. Welcome else. to Stanford. Um, um, so there's been um, a lot of uh, judges who have wrote very sparkly dissents in their time um, to, uh, to voice why they disagree with the majority um, for a number of reasons, and for maybe particularly um, on the role of precedent. Um, Justice Thomas recently also wrote a very long and informative uh, dissent in Flowers v. Mississippi where he thought that Babson was being misappropriated in that current decision. I just want to know what your take is on the role of dissents you think uh, they play in a court to, to uh, determine um, their own positions and uh, how they should be looked at in, uh, in the future. Sure. Um, that's, an, that's an interesting question. And I think the role of dissents can be sometimes a little bit different for the Supreme Court than they can be for 
a circuit judge. Um, sometimes circuit judges will use a dissent to highlight a problem that they think the Supreme Court may not be aware of. Um, more often, I think, um, judges, at least I'll speak for myself, um, you write a dissent when you feel like you need to, right? Um, if I can't, I'm in the business of trying to agree with my colleagues where I can, but my first and highest responsibility is to the Constitution, the oath I took, to the interpretation of the statute. statute. So I'm not going to be able to go along with something um, just for the purposes of, of getting a majority. Um, I try to do that. I think sometimes a lot of courts will try to write um, a decision more narrowly so that everyone can end up agreeing. But sometimes, um, sometimes for me at least, there's a decision where there's just something that needs that needs to be said in order to get your perspective out. Um, on my court too, that can be um, a signal to other judges on the court to call for en banc review of a particular case. Um, a judge who writes a dissent cannot call for en banc review under our court rules, and so I suspect that many um, many judges will try to also write those dissents as persuasively as possible in order to inspire someone else to call for um, an en banc review so that they can maybe end up writing the other way in the next round. Um, I believe you work for Judge Kavanaugh, and I wondered if you had some thoughts about his confirmation hearing. Um, I will say this. I have extraordinary respect for Justice Kavanaugh as a person and as a judge. I'm very happy that he was confirmed, and I feel fortunate to have had a long friendship with both him and his wife, Ashley. Um, and I feel, I feel very glad to see a, a person of his character. Um, what do you do with, uh, let's say you have a precedent on the books and then the Supreme Court comes out with a decision that doesn't directly overrule your court's precedent, let's say the Georgia Supreme Court, has something, uh, how, how vague is vague enough that your precedent stays on the books? I'll say for, for the 11th Circuit in particular, um, the, the funny thing is that, this is a little bit of a sidebar, I'll, I will answer your question, I promise, but the decisions of the Supreme Court are obviously binding on state courts as well as federal courts, but it turns out that they had far less direct relevance on a day-to-day -day basis when I was at the Georgia Supreme Court. Occasionally, certainly if they were reviewing one of our decisions, um, then that would be relevant, but very, very rarely were the Supreme Court's decisions um, directly applicable in a way that our precedents would be overruled. Obviously, that's not the case on the 11th Circuit, um, so it makes me read their decisions much more promptly than I maybe did before. But we've got at the 11th Circuit, and I don't know how other circuits treat this, but um, it's a pretty strict rule for when a, an 11th Circuit precedent is overturned by a Supreme Court precedent. So um, a belief that the Supreme Court would likely decide the decision, decide the case differently than we had based on a later precedent is certainly not enough. Um, I think there's, there's a little bit of a gray area where people may disagree from judge to judge, but it certainly requires more than even a very firm expectation that the court would go a different way. That it has to be really definitive that the Supreme Court's precedent means that ours is not, not intention, but incorrect. Sometimes, though, on banc review will be called for in a case like that to give the court the opportunity to square our precedent completely with the, full, with the Supreme Court's precedent. Uh, so as far as stare decisis is concerned, how should judges deal with lazy or ambiguous legislating? You know, so, I mean, where, you know, the legislature basically is like, oh, let the judges figure this one out. And, you know, one judge may have one opinion about it and another later judge a very different opinion. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not going to offer a how should, but I do think that some of the, a lot of the precedents, even from Justice Thomas, um, a lot of the discussion of precedent suggests that there's a range of permissible interpretations of a statute, right? So even... If Judge A says, well, I think the statute means this, and Judge B in a you know, different circuit says, I think it means that, it could be that both of those precedents are permissible. Of course, the Supreme Court would hopefully eventually resolve that. But um, I think the, the view is that there's, there's some range of possible interpretation. Um, some scholars have compared it 
to Chevron deference, right? There's a, if there's a statute that is, um, that has a, a particular range of agency interpretation, then maybe you might let those go and rather than choosing what you think is the very best one. So I do think there, are, I think that there are sometimes a lack of clarity in statutes and you, you do the best you can and go from there. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm over here. Right, there you go. <laughs> um, thank you for being here today. I was wondering if attitudes towards precedent tend to run harmoniously with other um, divides maybe in judicial opinion, maybe along originalist or intentionalist, textualist, do they tend to run concordantly with one another or you'd um, be surprised that there are people in the same camps? You know, I'm sure there are professors here who have looked at that question more deeply. My initial reaction is that that a view of precedent does not tend to track um, judicial philosophy. Um, I'm happy to stand corrected if there's a professor who's done a paper on that or something, but that's not been my impression looking through at the comments from various justices. Um, it's also interesting, if at least a few commentators have suggested that stare decisis became more important as um, views that the, the judges might want to implement their own personal preferences became stronger. So it's not, it, in, the, in these um, scholars' conceptions, it's not only that stare decisis has, has been a flat line and has always had a certain level of um, importance placed upon it, but as overall conceptions about the law and the sources of the law and the certainty of the law changed, then um, the importance that people placed on stare decisis changed along with that and in a lot of ways is a limiting tool to confine judges rather than um, just letting judges have a results-oriented free-for-all. Um, Heather, I was hoping you could discuss your thoughts on um, judges who are elected by popular vote and any possible incentive issues there and whether or not uh, that's relevant for considering uh, precedents that's made by those courts. So, speaking for myself, my position on the Supreme Court was I was initially appointed by the governor, but then I had to stand for election. Um, I actually couldn't go to the polls and vote for myself because it was the same day as my Senate confirmation hearing, which is a little bit um, of an odd happenstance. But in Georgia, elections are nonpartisan, um, which I think personally is positive because I think there's no partisan rule for a judge. Um, I was very glad that I didn't get a challenger because in my view, the only campaign platform for a judge that's appropriate is I will follow the law, right? And that's not, you're not gonna get the crowds whipped up by soberly promising to follow the law. Um, but I, I will say too, you know, you had, in order to make sure that you don't have a challenger, you have to raise money and the only people who are interested in giving money are litigants um, before the court. Um, certainly people have particular rules about if someone has a case in front of me right now, I won't accept their donation and things like that. But um, I, I will say that I never would have considered letting that impact my decision. Um, but I do think that it's, I do think that it, I prefer the federal system greatly as a judge, I'll say that. Um, just because you can spend your time being a judge rather than thinking about how to keep your job. Um, so I'm, the judges I have run into, I think, operate in good faith and are, are trying to do the right thing. But I do think there are some odd incentives about, um, about elections for judges. So I'm happy the Founding Fathers reached that particular conclusion. I think we have time for two more. Hi, I had a question. We've been talking a lot about stare decisis and previous precedent um, from the Supreme Court and other um, circuit courts. Um, I'd like to know how you approach decisions by other um, circuit courts when there are circuit splits and what deference you give in your judgments to um, certain persuasive authority? Sure. Um, it's interesting. A lot of questions, you know, when, when we'll get them, you'll see that four or five other circuits have already decided. Um, my personal approach is to actually wait and read those decisions once I've given the question some independent thought. Um, I think it's important to make decisions independently. Um, there have been plenty of cases, frankly, where six or seven circuits have gone in one direction, and then one circuit went um, 
in its own direction last, and then the Supreme Court took granted cert in order to solve that um, circuit split and ultimately went with the, the decision of the court who decided last. So I do think, of course, there is a lot of wisdom on other circuit courts, and I have a lot of respect for judges on those courts, but I think it's an important part of my role to decide the question for myself and then review those, those opinions, see if there's anything that, um, that persuades me in a different direction or offers additional support for something I've already been thinking. Um, I'd like to ask a question about binding precedent. Um, the soldiers of our country take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And if the commanding officer says, go slaughter the children in this, in this uh, village, that soldier is supposed to say no. At least that's my understanding. He's supposed to be bound by the Constitution. A and the fact that his commanding officer thinks otherwise, uh, we don't let him use that excuse. And, and yet the judges, if I understand correctly, you take the same oath and you're saying, uh, well, even if I think the Constitution is otherwise, I'm going to follow the president uh, set by my commanding officer. I'm going to go slaughter the children if that's what he's tell telling me to do. And, and you call this binding president. And to me, the, the logic escapes me why, why you have that uh, way of looking at things. Well, I think some people, I'm sure, don't have that way of looking at things. But I expect that those people um, would not be willing to serve as a judge because it is a pretty fundamental part of our system that lower courts are obligated to enforce the precedence of the higher courts. And certainly, as you, you heard the words of Justice Thomas, for those justices that have the authority to consider, to take a fresh look at those precedents, he has a very strong view that there is, there is no reason to implement um, an incorrect precedent. But I do think that institutionally, I think there's an important role. You would see a dramatic amount of chaos, I think, if all judges. Um, Sorry, but why don't you feel bound by the Constitution in the ultimate You know, there are, I think precedent itself is, many people think, um, a part of the judicial role which is written into the Constitution. Um, and I think, I certainly do feel an oath to the Constitution. And one, one part of that oath is to perform faithful service as I understand it, and as we've seen in generations of judges to come before. I don't think that I've got a monopoly on the only way of understanding how our system should work. And um, I, think that, I think that that's one reason that, at least for me, I think it's important to follow the precedence. That's part of my understanding of that role. Let's see if we have one more person who wants to ask a question. Anybody else? I just wanted to get your reading on what Alito said in the, uh, the final comments of your speech. And so essentially, I think he was getting at that judges should con like basically prognosticate uh, when it comes to determining whether a president should be overturned. And I was wondering if you actually agree with that. So I, I read him a little bit differently, actually. And as a, as a circuit judge who has been tasked with um, following some of these complicated precedents related to the Armed Career Criminal Act. Um, I, I can see his perspective that it, it is a very complicated and complex endeavor that the Supreme Court has, um, has set out with its interpretations of the various, the various clauses. Um, and so I don't, think that, I don't think that prognosticating is what he was thinking. I, my reading of it is that he, his approach was, we, we tried this, it's become clear that this exercise and this set of exercises is a lot more challenging than we anticipated that it would be when we first started out in the Taylor case. And because we've seen how, um, how off course, at least in his view, these precedents are, we should really turn around and go back to a simpler approach um, that will be easier for us to administer in the future. I think that's, that's my reading of what he was saying. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I hope you'll join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you.